Welcome to Science on Screen. Science on Screen creatively pairs screenings of classic, cult, science fiction and documentary films with lively presentations by notable experts from the world of science and technology. Today's film, Preparations to be Together for an Unknown Period of Time, is about the successful neurosurgeon Vizi Marta, who leaves her life and career in America behind to follow the love of her life to Budapest. But upon reuniting with him, the man claims he has never seen her before in his life. A suspenseful psychological thriller that simultaneously plays with elements of noir and melodrama, preparations to be together for an unknown period of time, is a capturing examination of the nature of love, memory and certainty. What happens when a master brain surgeon cannot trust her own mind? Today we are joined by Dr. David E. Warren, PhD, a cognitive neuroscientist and assistant professor in the Department of Neurological Sciences at UNMC, whose lab studies memory and brain networks by combining neuropsychological and neuroimaging methods. Hello, Dr. Warren. Thank you for joining us for our discussion today on preparations to be together for an unknown period of time. I'm looking forward to your thoughts. What struck you the most about the film? What stood out to you? What stood out to me about the film was um, in the context of a, uh, an intriguingly uh, twisty plot, uh, the implications about how memory can fail, uh, and also a really interesting and I think largely true to practice presentation of some elements of neurosurgery. I thought the, the fact that two of the main characters were uh, neurosurgeons and you know the reflections of their, um, their surgical practice in the, uh, and all the, the tools that they use to support the, their surgeries was relatively accurate. I wanted to like tie that to the work that you do in your lab. If you could talk a little bit about that and maybe also tell us about the neuroscientific basis of quote unquote false memories. It's a great question. So, uh, you know, my background is in memory. Uh, I uh, came up, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist by training, um, and I've always been interested in memory and how we uh, do remember things and sometimes how we don't remember things. Um, and one of the, uh, one interesting approach to studying how memory works is to study how memory can fail. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it's something that's been a focus of a lot of my work. Um, you know, memory can fail in all kinds of different ways. We can completely fail to remember something. We can fail to recognize someone uh, we know, which might, might be an element of the, the plot here. We can uh, fail to recognize that we've uh, heard a certain fact or been a certain place before. Memory, and this, these are sort of, these are relatively conventional failures. You might not recognize someone if you haven't seen them for a while. Um, but there are other kinds of memory failures too that reflect in, in uh, these failures, we can find evidence of how our memory system must function mm -hmm. uh, in everyday life. So if anyone uh, who's listening um, has ever experienced deja vu, deja vu is a very different kind of memory failure. Uh, deja vu is the sense that you've been somewhere before or that you've seen something before, even when you couldn't have because it's a novel experience. And deja vu from the perspective of a, a cognitive psychologist or a cognitive neuroscientist, reflects a failure of uh, the system insofar as you're recognizing something that is new. It should be flagged as new. Mm -hmm. It should be novel in your experience, and yet your memory system is telling you you've been here before, and that, that's one kind of failure. There's another kind of failure that contrasts with that, also taken from the French, jamais vu. Jamais vu is kind of the inverse of deja vu. Jamais vu is being in a familiar place, but having it feel unfamiliar, and that, mm -hmm. that sense of jamais vu could have been a feature of the plot of this movie where that we have two characters who should be acquainted based on common experience uh, or the beliefs of one of them, and yet one insists that they haven't met. And so we've got kind of an interesting contrast. And these are all potential failures of memory, real memories, false memories. They're all driven by the same system and looking how successes and failures can help us to characterize and understand uh, these memory systems better. And when you look at the causes of mm -hmm. these failures, is there any kind of like connection between like memory and affection, memory and love, like mm -hmm. the emotional basis of like these, let's say failures, but they could also be like serendipitous, I mm -hmm. guess, like yeah. successes, if you yeah. say that. No, it's a really interesting uh, point. And what I could say is that there are um, several really well, well characterized cases uh, of amnesia where 
uh, a romantic uh, connection plays a really central role. Mm -hmm. So when watching this movie and thinking about how affection and love um, can be preserved in the face of amnesia, I, I thought immediately of a, a famous case uh, from England, a gentleman named Clive Waring. Um, and Clive Waring was a musician by training, also a conductor. And unfortunately, uh, in midlife, after marrying, uh, he had uh, a severe case of what they call viral encephalitis, essentially an infection that caused uh, damage to his brain. And afterward, he was severely amnesic, couldn't readily form new memories and lost many memories that he had had previously. But one thing that he held on to with tremendous intensity that's reflected if you ever see video of Clive Waring is his overwhelming love for uh, his wife, Deborah. Every time Deborah walks into a room, he explodes. He goes from being uh, a man who feels cursed, feels like he's, you know, trapped. And when he sees Deborah, joy, utter joy, you know, welcoming her as though, uh, you know, he hasn't seen her in years, even though she might have just left the room and come back uh, five or ten minutes later. Um, I also wanted to like ask you about like the certain technological aspects that are like depicted in the film, because yep. our main character is a neurosurgeon yep. and she deals with a patient who starts having problems remembering words and she goes into surgery to like operate on his brain. Can you talk about like the place of like that kind of like neuroimagery uh, technology that is like being depicted in the film? Um, neurosurgery uh, is a delicate balance, like many different kinds of medicine, it's a delicate balance between preserving function and treating disease. Uh, and so in the cases we saw in uh, the, the movie, we had cases where I think there was a glioblastoma, a, a brain tumor, a uh, very aggressive one, and there was a decision made that um, that, that should be resected, should be mm -hmm. uh, removed from the brain. And one of the things that they portray really well in the movie uh, that I think is absolutely true of nurse, neurosurgical practice is the, over, the, the extraordinary efforts that neurosurgeons will go to to preserve uh, what we might call eloquent parts of the brain, parts of the brain that help you receive and output information. So when we think of eloquent parts of the brain, we think of uh, motor movements, uh, we think of speech, mm -hmm. we think of hearing and language, critically. Um, and the, um, the, what, the, what we see in the movie where during surgery the patient is awake and they're monitoring his functions in an ongoing way, that is, uh, very true to neurosurgical practice. So there are tremendous efforts before somebody ever gets on the operating table uh, to map out where the language and motor centers of their brain might be using technologies, including uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, including magnetoencephalography sometimes, which actually are uh, unusual among medical centers, uh, especially in the Midwest, we have a magnetoencephalography system at uh, UNMC that can also map brain activity. And also some really interesting uh, techniques like a, um, a WADA test is one that's used to check hemisphere, uh, hemispheric localization of language and motor function, where they actually uh, anesthetize one half of the brain and then the other and see what functions are preserved uh, or disrupted. All of these measures are often taken, all of these procedures are often uh, performed before surgery with the goal that the neurosurgeon has the best possible idea of where these functions might be localized to in the brain before, you know, before the, the skull is opened and the surgery is performed. Yeah, and I, if I remember correctly, the metaphor that is used in the movie for that kind of eloquent functioning is the palaces of the brain, mm -hmm. where we, or neurosurgeons, not I, yeah. <laughs> demolish old buildings if necessary mm -hmm. in order to be able to preserve those palaces. Yeah, no, and that, that's a, it was a fascinating analogy, not one I've heard before, but I think it's very apt, uh, this idea that, you know, with, with the decision to proceed with neurosurgery, there, there will be almost certainly brain tissue sacrificed. And ideally, it will only be the brain tissue that is pathological, that is displaying signs of not being healthy. Um, but yeah, the, the idea of preserving eloquent cortex and treating it as a treasure that should be uh, first identified, found, and then preserved, I think is a really uh, beautiful metaphor. And one of our characters is asked, who's a neurosurgeon, mm -hmm. how it feels to have like the feelings and thoughts in one's hand. As a neuroscientist, I'm gonna kind of like twist the question for you. How does it feel to see, almost like a film, those feelings and like thoughts in front of you? And like, how do you approach, you know, in your personal and professional life, this connection between, you know, your domain of study 
and let's say the movements of the heart and the mind? You know, it's a fascinating question and there is, even as someone who does this as, as their day job, a cognitive neuroscientist who necessarily believes that the physical brain supports our, our minds, our, uh, our beliefs, uh, our memories. Sometimes it's hard to, to reconcile those things. The idea that this, you know, this small uh, part of our body, this organ, uh, drives all of our perceptions, all of our thoughts, our identity, our memory. Um, are there like any other like exciting research ongoing in your lab that you would like to describe maybe in layman's terms to us? Yeah, no, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about some of the research that my lab is doing. We have a number of ongoing studies um, generally focused around the idea of memory uh, because that, again, that's uh, one of the things that I, I personally love to study. Um, one of our ongoing studies is funded by the National Institute of Aging um, and it's a study that actually tries uh, we are addressing Alzheimer's disease, but from a kind of a novel perspective. Mm -hmm. The idea being that we study healthy children, we study their memory, we study their, uh, their brains, their brain structure and their brain function, and we get some information about their genetics with the idea that decades from now, uh, some of these children might be at risk for Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. and we can actually use their genes to help us understand how they might be at risk for Alzheimer's disease. So this is an ongoing study. We, we gave it a, uh, the name is the Polygenic Risk of Alzheimer's Disease in Nebraska Kids, which we shortened to Prank. We gave it a silly name, but it's, it's serious science, and we're excited to be able to be doing this in the community. Really exciting and important yeah. work. Well, we thank you for joining us today, Absolutely. and we are hoping that our audiences also enjoyed the movie as much as we did. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.